Hali Do, and welcome to Native Chalk Talk, a podcast by Natives for all. Here, we're keeping our Native ancestors' stories and history alive, while also sharing with you our Native culture, traditions, and more. I'm Rachel Youngman, a Choctaw originally from Anadarko, Oklahoma. I hope you'll enjoy this journey with me as we learn from our Native American guests. And I hope you'll do me a favor. Feel free to like and share these episodes. I so appreciate it. Yakuki. Big news, y'all. One of my favorite Choctaw authors, Sarah Elizabeth Sawyer, has a writing course called Fiction Writing American Indians. Now, this course will show you how to discover the insight you need to write quality, authentic stories. You'll also learn practical approaches to researching Native cultures and get answers to hard questions. I'll be taking the same course, and I invite you to take it with me. Just go to AmericanIndians.FictionCourses.com. Dot com. But don't forget to use the code CHOCKTALK, that's C-H-O-C-T-A-L-K, when you go to checkout to get $30 off. Yes, let's do this. Listeners, would you like to hear about Choctaw Parker, a railroad detective who works to solve all manner of murder most foul in Florida in the Gilded Age? Well, hold on to your hats because today I have the pleasure of visiting with retired U.S. Army Cavalry Officer James D. Brewer, who will share about his edge of your seat historical fiction book, Blood on the Cross Ties, The Florida Chautauqua Murders. Welcome to Native Chalk Talk, Major Brewer. Thank you. Thank you for taking an interest in my story. Absolutely. It was very intriguing. I had a great time reading it. Uh, but first off, thank you for your service, sir. <laughs> and now, listeners, let's learn more about Major Brewer, or as I'll now call him, James, and his background. It's an impressive one. As a freelance writer, James D. Brewer has contributed articles and stories to national magazines for more than 45 years. In addition to writing about history, sports, human interest, self-defense, crime prevention, and business, Brewer has also authored five novels in the critically acclaimed Macy Baldridge, Luke Williamson mystery series, as well as three nonfiction books, The Danger from Strangers, The Raiders of 1862, and Tom Worthington's Civil War, Shiloh Sherman, and The Search for Vindication. I'm going to have to get all of those books. A frequent guest speaker and a teacher of writing seminars, Brewer travels widely in the conduct of research and interviews for his upcoming books. A retired U.S. Army Cavalry officer, Brewer has worked as editor-in-chief of a national magazine, and he served as an assistant professor of English at the United States Military Academy, West Point, New York. Wow. Mr. Brewer retired after 30 years of service to the nation as a department of the Army soldier and civilian, having trained widely in combat weapons and martial arts. His last position before retirement was Chief Requirements and Integration Division, U.S. Army Training and Doctrine Commands, or TRADOC, Capability Manager for Live Training at Fort Eustis, Virginia. Brewer is a member of the musical group, The High Road Ramblers, where he plays guitar, banjo, and mandolin, and writes original songs in the traditional acoustic sounds of 1950s and 60s folk music, bluegrass, old-time country, and rockabilly music. Mr. Brewer has spent the last 50 years training in and teaching a variety of martial arts. He is married, has two children, and seven grandchildren and he currently resides in Florida, where he serves as an adjunct professor of English composition and writing at Polk State College. He is currently writing the three-book Choctaw Parker Mystery Adventure Series. And I think my listeners are probably wondering, so I'll just have to ask you, James, is there anything you don't do? Oh, listen, there are many things that I am not proficient at. But, uh, <laughs> I, let's just say- I don't believe I you. <laughs> I, I, I have many interests. Um, I have many interests and uh, I, I never suffer from boredom. It sounds like it. And I'm kind of jealous because you, um, and, you know, you retired and then you went on to do more things that you love as well. And um, again, very jealous of that and very proud of all that you do. So what tribes are you from? Well, you know, I don't know the answer to that, actually. Yeah, I'm like a lot of people who, who through their family history are told that they have some 
connection to, to Native American cultures, but I do mm -hmm. know that the name Provo or Provow, P-R-O-V-O-W, surfaces in the family history a little bit. So I think the connection is through there. My interest in the Choctaw Nation seeds from the fact that I grew up in West Tennessee and uh, North Mississippi area. And so that's very close. That and the Chickasaw Nation were very important in, in that part of the country. Absolutely. I wondered where that interest came from. So before we get started, where can folks find your book, Blood on the Cross Ties? Blood on the Cross Ties is available on Amazon.com. It's also available through Barnes & Noble or through the publisher at Touchpoint Press. Uh, I can announce to you that this month, later toward the end of this month, the audio version of Blood on the Cross Ties will be available on uh, audiobooks.com for those of you that want to put about eight hours of good listening in while you're driving cross country or something. Uh, it will <laughs> be available. That's perfect. Are you going to be the voice on it? I am not the narrator. Uh, we explored that possibility, but I've got a few other irons in the fire and uh, <laughs> I, I don't think I would have yeah. had the time, even if they had thought I would be a good narrator, I, uh, I didn't have the time. So I did audition a couple of folks to do the narration and, and they- Oh, that's great. Individual. Again, we're going to talk today about the stories and even the history behind your book, Blood on the Cross Ties, The Florida Chautauqua Murders. This book, which is the first of three in a series, is a historical mystery. And I love how it intertwines between fascinating real life characters in history and the world of the fictional Choctaw man, Jimmy Lee Parker. So why don't you tell us the high level premise of the book? Well, there were three great railroad barons of Florida. The first was William Chipley, who built the, the railroad from Pensacola over toward Tallahassee. Uh, the second would be uh, Henry Flagler of Flagler University fame, who built the the railroad down the East Coast, ultimately all the way to Key West. And the third railroad baron was Henry Plant, who built the plant system down through Tampa and Plant City and, and all the way down to Punta Gorda. And the premise of the story is, in each of the three books, Jimmy Lee Choctaw Parker works for one of the three great railroad barons of Florida. And in the first book, Blood of the Cross Tie, he's working for William Chipley. And there's been a railroad uh, a robbery uh, that's greatly influenced William Chipley's planned Florida Chautauqua, which was a gathering of culture and art and religion and music, uh, the first one to ever be held in Florida. So Chipley is concerned that that's going to ruin the participation in his Chautauqua. So he hires Parker to see if he can find out what happened to recover some lost uh, stolen money, uh, some stolen rifles, uh, that belong to the army. And that's how he gets involved in murder most foul in the peninsula area. Ooh, I love it. It's full of intrigue. It keeps you on the edge of your seat. And I would say that it's also good for um, younger folks to read as well. So I have a lot of homeschoolers that listen to my show and I think it would be great to um, have them as part of kind of there's it's historical fiction. So there is history mixed in there. And that's one of the things that I do love about this book was learning bits of history with the railroad, as well as the lawlessness and gambling days of the cowboy. To me, it's important in historical fiction. The first thing you've got to do is tell a good story. Yes. And if in the process of telling a good story, folks learn a little history, then that's a bonus. If you just want to tell history, then you write a nonfiction history book. Yeah. You've got to have a good story with rich, engaging characters. As, as uh, I often say to people in writing groups, you get your characters in trouble and you try to get them out. And that creates I love a pretty it. good story. That's fantastic. Listeners, you're going to find yourself smack dab in the middle of a time when multiple races were intermixing, or in some cases, trying not to intermix. There were prejudices coming from multiple angles, and there's this sort of angst that trouble was always brewing, including violence from the Ku Klux Klan, in fact. Also brewing were topics such as politics, religion, slavery, the freedmen, war, and the North and the South. 
So this story really centers around what was going on with the railroad and its incredible expansion during the 1800s, connecting all of these people and races and culture and places. And the railroad does also tie, which I think is very interesting, into the Gilded Age. Would you share with us a bit about the Gilded Age and how the railroad and that age in history kind of go hand in hand? Well, the steamboat industry, which I featured in my first five book mystery series, dominated after the, uh, before and shortly after the Civil War. But as the railroads began to expand <clears throat> in the 1870s and 80s and 90s, that became the predominant way of moving people and goods. Steamboat world began to decline. We have time zones today, Rachel, because of railroads. You oh. see, that's where we came with, up with time zones. You see, if everybody had their own time, it was impossible to plant a uh, schedule to run from Savannah, Georgia to Memphis, Tennessee, if every other county had a different time. Right. So, so time zones developed across the country so that the railroad industry could time out its routes. So that's one derivative. Uh, it opened up to settlement and trade areas that uh, would have been much more difficult to, to uh, access uh, uh, by foot or by wagon or by horse. So the, the railroad was hugely important and it developed uh, tycoons, like I mentioned, like Chipley and Flagler and Plant. They became instrumental in, uh, in developing business and giving people jobs. It's just a tremendously important part of the Gilded Age. Wonderful. It reminded me when I was reading through this and, and reading about the railroad, about uh, the men who built America. I don't know if you've seen that that show on the history channel. Yes, yes. So good. So listeners, I mentioned that you'll learn about history as you read along, which I love. Before we get into the characters of this book, why don't you tell us about the setting of the railroads, Pensacola and Atlantic Railroad, a subsidiary of the Louisville and Nashville Railroad. Okay. Well, you see the l and the Louisville and Nashville was one of the major railroad lines in the 1880s, 90s and beyond. And William Chipley was uh, operating as the president of the Pensacola Atlantic Railroad. So he's the guy, the driving force behind building the railroad from Pensacola, Florida, across the Panhandle that eventually got over to Tallahassee. Okay. He, was a, he was a subsidiary of the l &N Railroad, and the president of the l &N Railroad was Robert DeFuniac, or DeFuniac. Hmm. And that's for whom DeFuniac Springs, Florida is named and the Funiac Springs, Florida uh, is a major setting in the story. And Chipley is a town in Florida, just uh, east of the Funiac Springs and it's named for William Chipley. And so even the towns, if you're driving along I-10 and in that area, you look up, you see Chipley, you see the Funiac, these are the names of the people that were running the railroads in those days. Mm, so cool. Yeah, now that, that really brings it all together. Like these towns were named after those visionary people. If a city, if a city was growing, but yep. the railroad bypassed the city and went to another city, it's the city that got the railroad that grew up and expanded and the other uh, one usually vanished and disappeared. So true, isn't it? And same with prior to that, the rivers where you'd have a lot of exactly. boats coming in and interesting. So as you mentioned, there are some real life historical figures within the book, but James, you've also got some folks you wrote into the story who are fictional characters. So I just kind of wanted to point those out. Tell us about the hero of the book, Jimmy Lee Parker, also known as Choctaw. Jimmy Lee Parker is a man walking a tightrope between two cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, he's half white and half Choctaw. He is Mother was a French Arcadian woman who was found shivering in cold along the Mississippi River mm. by Choctaw's father, who took her in, saved her life. She became his wife, and Choctaw Parker was born. So he is, he would be called a half breed. Right. In other words, half white, half Choctaw. And as a result of that, and many people can relate to this, many people. I've talked to that have read the story who come from biracial families or situations where they're, they're pulled between two cultures. That's Parker. Yeah. He's, he's, he's too white 
to be fully trusted by the Choctaw and too Choctaw to be trusted by the white. Mm. And so he's in this, in this realm of between the two where he wants very much to embrace the cultures in both areas, but he's constantly running into obstacles. Uh, yeah. But as a result of that cross fertilization of those cultures, he ends up being an educated man who uh, is capable of moving in and out of both realms. He, he is single now because his wife has died of yellow fever in the 1870s. Mm -hmm. His wife and daughter died of yellow fever. He was depressed. He couldn't could carry on. He got a job as a track walker. That's the person that moves between one city and the other alone. So he didn't have to be around anybody and has to have an eye for detail to see if there's any problems along the track. And because he did that well, and because he did that with, with detail and, and attention, he got a few jobs investigating small crimes around the railroad and suddenly his name came up. And before you know it, he's being hired by Robert DeFumiak, mm. president of the LNN, and then the Chipley. And then you've also got his trusty sidekick, Chubb Moody, who I found to be so lovable throughout the book. Tell us about him. You know, Chubb, Chubb got dealt a bad hand in life. Chubb, Chubb was living with his parents uh, and they ran a, uh, a, a general store in, in Alabama, just north of Birmingham. And uh, they refused to side with the Confederacy during the war or the Union. They tried to stay neutral. And what they received for that was they got ravaged by both sides. They had mm. their property stolen. They had their, their building burned down. His, 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 his uh, mother is killed. His father dies later. And Chubb, at a young age, is, is on his own. He became what he would call a general flunky and just kind of move from job to job. Mm -hmm. But the thing about Chubb that's interesting, he's one of those people that can read something or see something one time and he knows it, he remembers it. People might call that a photographic memory today, but he's got that capability. And it gives him kind of a unique aspect to his life, but he is a jovial kind of fellow, loves music, loves to sing, uh, loves to sing along when Parker's playing the fiddle. And Parker plays the fiddle because it's his way of escaping from some of the challenges he deals with. That fiddle was given to him by his mother. And so he wow. treasures that greatly. So that fiddle appears in all three of the stories. I was going to ask, yeah, that kind of storyline follows through all three books. Absolutely, absolutely. Chubb is confident on his own, but he loves Jimmy Lee Parker. Parker is the only man that ever made him feel like he was worth something. Yeah, and, and obviously Parker trusts him immensely. Very much. So they make a good team. And then you've got Matilda Vance, which is a bit of a mysterious character. What can you tell us about her? Okay, now Matilda Vance's story is interesting because I'll tell you where the character of Matilda Vance came from, because I think it's important for people to know. My great-grandmother's name was Matilda Vance. Aww. Now, Matilda Vance... Husband died during the war, just like the character in this story. And she moved west uh, to Missouri, and, but she died of tuberculosis in 1873. So one day I was formulating this story and I asked myself the following rhetorical question. What if, what if Matilda Vance had not died? What would her life have been like after the war? And right. you know, women, women didn't have a lot of opportunities right after the Civil War. You could do one of about four things. You could remarry somebody with some money, maybe that you didn't love, okay, just to have the security. You could become a seamstress or take and wash. Mm -hmm. uh, you could maybe look after someone's children, or you could become a prostitute. And that's what a lot of women, not the latter one necessarily, but those were basically the four choices you had at the time. Mm -hmm. Women didn't have opportunities. I right. said, well, what would, what would have become of her if, that had, if she had lived. So she becomes a very adept gambler. She becomes a game called Pharaoh. She plays poker and other games, but she's very similar to an actual historical figure by the name of Lottie Denno, who was very popular out West as a lady gambler. Interesting. I didn't know that that was the background of Matilda. So you kind of merge these two stories together, Absolutely. but something that's very personal to you as well. 
And as you, um, when I was looking at kind of the history that you were following throughout, you know, weaved in throughout this book, I went and started looking up all the characters, the real, the real life characters that we're about to talk about in a second. And oh my gosh, I went down such a rabbit hole. It was so much fun. So let's delve into that a little bit. So there are um, those three fictional characters and then Matilda is connected to the real life person, George Duvall. What did you learn yes. about George's story and history as you incorporated him into the book? I learned about George Duvall back in the 1990s when I was researching and writing uh, the five Macy Baldrige, Luke Williamson steamboat mysteries. That's where I first came across Duvall. And Duvall was the king of the riverboat gamblers. <laughs> this guy was, well, he's got, there's an interesting book called 40 Years a Gambler on the Mississippi. I okay. suggest that as, as reading for anyone. Write it down, y'all. Interesting. 40 Years of Gambler on the Mississippi. It's his autobiography. And Duvall was a hard-headed, literally guy. He would get into fights and headbutt people. He was a hard, he was a hard-headed guy. He, uh, but he, and, and quite a rounder and uh, not always on the up and up with his gambling. But okay. one thing he wouldn't do is he wouldn't cheat preachers. He, hmm. he had some sense of values. If he beat a preacher out of his money, he would usually give it back to him. But Aww. that's where I first came across Duvall. So I wanted Duvall to be part of this story because of his gambling experience. So the story starts off with, with him being aligned with Matilda Vance. And they're kind yeah. of a team, team of yeah. gamblers working together. She's acting as a shield sometimes for him. But it yeah. doesn't stay that way throughout the story. Now, you may not be able to answer this to me, and that's okay. So just let me know. But I kind of wondered through the whole book if George and Matilda kind of liked each other. Do you do you feel like they did or did they not? Well, you know, I don't want to say too much on that. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think George may have liked Matilda, maybe a bit more than Matilda liked Joy from mm. a romantic standpoint. They right. were business partners. They were basically business partners. Yeah. Well, and she seems like a very independent woman. So maybe she's like, I got my own thing going, George. So she, she might, she might say, uh, she might say that. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So let's hear about the real life character, William Chipley, who hires Choctaw Parker to look into some robberies and murder sure. around the railroads of trains. Well, you know, Chipley, uh, I talk about it in the book. Chipley was the actual president of the railroad being built from Pensacola. They laid over 200 miles of track over months and months, and it was quite a challenge, a physical challenge to do that. He, uh, he had political aspirations, though. Uh, Chipley wanted to host that first Florida Chautauqua because yeah. they, were, they were traditionally held up north. They began in New York, and uh, people would go to them, and, and it was a great cultural event. And they would stay a day. You could get a pass for a day, or you could get a pass for a week, or you could get a pay and stay the whole month. And people either stayed in cabins or tents on the ground. And he thought, you know, if they could do that in, in the summer in New York, why couldn't Florida do it in the winter when everybody wants to come down here anyway? So it right. was really one of the opening salvos in convincing people to come to Florida as a tourist destination destination in the winter. So Chipley wants this to come off. He builds a grand new hotel in the Phoenix Springs just to service the Chautauqua. And that figures into the story, the development of this hotel. Uh, and then Chipley later ran a and was successful in, in getting into the Florida State Senate. Hmm. And uh, he had aspiration beyond that. He ran for U.S. Senate and he lost by one vote. Oh, my gosh. So don't ever let anybody tell you that one vote doesn't matter. True that. So he would have been a U.S. senator, but for one vote. Hmm. And uh, he eventually died in Washington, D.C. Uh, about 1897. I assume he died wealthy as well, right? Oh, he, he, he had a little pocket change. He, he had a little walking around money. I bet he did. <laughs> well, we'll learn more about the lives and fate of some of the other nonfiction characters in the book in just a bit. In the book, you talk about the gambling card game of Pharaoh. So how do you play Pharaoh? Pharaoh, Pharaoh was the most popular gambling game 
uh, during that period of time, the 1880s and 90s, more popular than poker. You know, when you watch a Western mm -hmm. or something, they're always sitting around playing poker. Yeah. The, the reality is more people play Pharaoh than play poker. Pharaoh is a game where you have a layout of all the cards by number, you know. Uh, right. One, just one suit laid out there. So it's a game where you're betting on a number to come up, not betting on a suit. And so you okay. put your money on the layout on top of the card you're betting on. And the dealer has a deck and the first card they turn over is a losing card. And anybody that's got money on that card loses. And then the second card that's turned over is the winning card. And anybody that has money on that wins. Hmm. And it reminds you a little bit of roulette without the spin. In other words, you could put money between okay. two different yeah. numbers <laughs> if you wanted to. So that was, it was a one-to-one -one bet, generally one-to-one -one bet, except when you got to the last three cards in the deck. And okay. If you could predict the order of the last three cards in the deck, then you would know uh, you could bet that and you'd win four to one. That was that was referred to as calling the turn. Calling the turn. Okay, calling this sounds like harder than I would have thought. I mean, as far as chance goes. Actually, the Oz and Pharaoh are pretty good if it's a clean, fair game. In okay. fact, they had Pharaoh in Las Vegas until the early 1980s. Really? And they got rid of it because the odds weren't good enough for the casino. Oh, well, that's interesting. Factoids for you guys. I hope you listeners are enjoying this about Pharaoh. You, more people know about it than I did. Well, thanks for that info on Pharaoh. I just learned a lot. So again, in this period of time, there's a lot going on. And part of your book includes the topic of the freedmen. And for yes. those who may not know much about the freedmen, feel free to share so that when they read your book, which I know they will, they'll have a greater understanding of that history. Well, now the freedmen were the, were the slaves at the end of the war who were free. They were freed men and women. They were called mm -hmm. the freedmen. And the, 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 the government at the time developed what was called the Freedmen's Bureau. And it was a bureaucratic institution that was trying its best to provide opportunities for these recently freed slaves to have access to land, uh, jobs, and, and to get on with their lives because they, they had had no life beyond who, wherever they were enslaved. Now, there were plenty of freed men running around before the war ended uh, of color, but we're talking about the Freedmen Bureau servicing people who had been slaves. And so to do so, they had to come up with some land. And so there was some tension created between the government at that time would be the federal government. The Confederate States are gone now, and it's after the war. The federal government and the Freedmen's Bureau had to come up with ways to get land and opportunity. And so to get land, sometimes they had to take it from others. So mm -hmm. sometimes they would take the, oftentimes they would take a large piece of plantation land that belonged to a Southern landowner and divided up among freedmen. Now you can imagine that was pretty good for the freedmen, but it didn't sit very well with the Southern landowner or, and or his descendants. Right. And so you had that tension going on there. Uh, and, and of course, then parallel to that, the racial tensions that existed then didn't go away. They were still there just because the war ended. And you have the rise of organizations like the Ku Klux Klan and others. Uh, but there were there were uh, depredations, shall we say, committed by both sides after the war. Uh, there were depredations committed by Ku Klux Klan and those who resisted that. And there were depredations committed by some of the freedmen uh, in, mm -hmm. in getting this land. So what I try to do in historical fiction is... I, I try to just tell the truth and let people decide what they think about it. In other words, I don't write a piece of historical fiction to make a political case. I'm just yeah. going to tell you, here's what happened. Read it mm -hmm. and see what you think about it. Yeah. It's like my approach in when I teach composition and rhetoric. I tell my students, my job in, as a college instructor is not to te tell you what to think, but to teach you how to think. Smart. I think we need more of that in the world today. We do need more of that in the world. So my books are going to always lay the, we have a saying in our family, the truth only hurts if it should. Oh, so I'm, yeah. I'm just going to tell you the truth <laughs> and you figure it out. 
I'd love to give my listeners a taste of what goes on in your book. So let's go. Some folks are playing Pharaoh and your main character, Jimmy Lee, Chalk Talk Parker says what? Okay. Well, let's see. I, I have a little text here, so I'll share it with you. Yeah. So J- Jimmy Lee is sitting there and he's playing Pharaoh, but he's, he, he's really watching that poker table over there because that's where his target, George Duvall, is sitting and playing poker. So he's playing Pharaoh, but he's, he and Chubb Moody, his, his, his colleague, are watching that table over there to make sure they can make a move and capture yes. George Duvall. But <laughs> while he's playing Pharaoh, because Parker likes to play Pharaoh, he, he says, copper the eight. And he slides a stack of chips on the layout and drops an Indian head penny on top of that stack of chips. The man he's watching across the room was George Duvall, dressed in an immaculate white shirt, a dark green ascot, and a patterned vest. Duvall, one of the most proficient gamblers working the railroads and steamboat lines, was holding court in the poker room at the New Continental Hotel. And over at the poker table, Duvall laid his cards down and raked in the chips as his opponents shook their heads and cursed their luck. They're joined at the faro table by a, a lovely auburn-haired Matilda Vance, one of the slickest card players in the Southeast. Call the turn, the faro dealer declared. Parker consulted an abacus-looking device that tracked what cards had been played. And he said, eight, jack, five. And he slid his bet out on the layout. The dealer turned the eight of spades, the jack of diamonds, and the last card called the hawk was the five of spades. Winner, winner, four to one, the dealer said as he paid Parker and began shuffling the cards. So there you go. You know what? I think you should be the voice of your own book. That's pretty Uh good. (laughs) I loved hearing it in your voice. That was fun. So that gives a a brief view into those fun moments of Pharaoh. However, that's a pretty PG version. Throughout the book, we run into some fights around the game and you really do a great job of making people feel like they're right there in the midst of the skirmishes. We'll be back after this quick break. Are you looking for the perfect gift for your significant other, your bestie, or even yourself? You know you're worth it. Luxury soaps, lotions, and lip balms from Baker's Bar Soapery are 100% Choctaw talk crafted, and they make the perfect gifts. This work of art is their signature turquoise soap, and it's made to look like Sleeping Beauty turquoise. Do you see this gold veining throughout? And the gold marbling on top? Love it. Next, check out this Apple Mint custom fragrance oil soap called Say Their Name. And all proceeds go to the Missing Murdered Indigenous Women Chutta cause. You'll only find this blend made specifically for this soap. And yes, these are made with goat's milk, which leaves your skin feeling soft and supple. So load up on these Choctaw soaps made by Tiffany at Baker's Bar Soapery at thebbsoapery.com. But be sure to get 20% off when you use the code Native Choctaw, that's all caps, when you spend $25 or more. Treat yourself to the luxury your skin deserves with Baker's Bar Soapery. So Choctaw Parker receives a Western Union telegram and is hired by William D. Chipley, general manager of the Pensacola and Atlantic Railroad, of course, to investigate a train robbery. Now, as the railroad is paving the way for people to travel far and wide, so is communication becoming a newfound connection. And as you can see, when Choctaw Parker's right-hand man, Chubb Moody, talks about the telephone, feel free to read from your book about that moment. Well, what I do is, before I read, let me make a comment. What's so interesting about the the Gilded Age is it has so many parallels to today. Mm -hmm. New technologies were coming along, like the telephone, uh, ultimately the automobile, uh, uh, electric lights. These emerging new technologies were changing people's lives. Kind of sounds like today with technological advances and AI on the horizon and all that's going on in the world. During that period, they had just come through a terrible pandemic that killed people and they didn't know why. And it was called yellow jack or yellow fever. And people were quarantining themselves and wearing masks. That sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? Doesn't it? 
and the parallels between then and now are are amazing. They, they just come through a very divisive war, and there were many amputees and injured soldiers running around after that. Well, duh. I think we have too recently, haven't we? Yes, sir. So the parallels are there between those two worlds. Hmm. Uh, so wow. the, the piece I'm going to read about is <clears throat> the telephone has just been invented, and there are only a few of them around in certain cities and they're direct line. In other words, you had a line maybe from the hotel to the livery stable or from the wharf where the boat came into the hotel, but you just couldn't call just anyone, but you could, you could talk on a single line. So this is, this is Chubb Moody using his observational powers, which I said were pretty, pretty intense, mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> talking to Parker about what he's found there in the hotel. Moody leaned over the table and whispered as if communicating some great secret. Do you know what they've got here at this hotel? He asked, his eyes lighting up. They got one of them telephones. That's so, Parker said. Yes, sir. I seen it this morning. I got to shoot in the breeze with the desk clerk. And he let me slip back there and take a look at it. Oddest thing you ever saw. You're talking to this cone and your voice goes over a wire, and just like the telegraph, and comes out the other end. I stood right there and heard him talk to someone down at the train depot. Can you believe it? And he's got a second one that goes to the livery right here in town. Parker said, what's that got to do with the Western Union runner? way I see it, Mr. Parker, Moody said, is that one of these days, there ain't going to be no need for a runner carrying messages all over town. I'll bet you everybody will have one of them telephones. And that's the, the part about the telephone. And Parker, I, I, I won't read it now, but Parker makes the astute observation to the effect that ah, it's never going to happen. Nobody's going to want to talk through a box when they can talk to each other. I love that. I love that because we forget, we take it all for granted. And again, your historical fiction pieces in there bringing in what was going on with innovation at the time. This really speaks to that. Okay. So there are items that were stolen that initiated this whole investigation into the train robbery. So what were the items in the book that, that were stolen? Well, money, first of all, payroll, a payroll was stolen. Uh, the amounts, uh, I'll just leave you to find out about in the book. Uh, it was a payroll ship from the First National Bank of Palatka, Florida, because you see at that time, there were a number of banks around the country who could print money rather than the U.S. Mint doing it. Banks mm. could print it, and they were called national banks. So this payroll is stolen. That's one item. Another item that's stolen are trapdoor Springfield rifles. Trapdoor Springfield rifles. Um, mm -hmm. excuse me just a moment I have a okay. message Okay. my chief financial officer had just arrived okay got it That's oh, my, wife. my wife is my chief financial officer oh. yes, yeah. yes. Uh, your CFO is very busy today I see he's, busy, he's a busy woman today yes uh, <laughs> what was stolen were, were, uh, were called a model 1884 trapdoor Springfield rifles and uh, this was a, a very po popular rifle that was used by the United States Army at the time. But these particular rifles had the addition of a special ladder sight on the back of them invented by a fellow named Colonel Buffington. It was called the Buffington Sight. So they were very desirable because they improved the long range. You could shoot much further with accuracy with these rifles. But somebody had right. stolen 100 of them. And, and that's a big deal. Uh, they can't have 100 Army rifles floating around in the hands of God knows who. So mm -hmm. uh, Chipley, you got Chipley's interest in, in, in getting this thing solved to keep from destroying the attendance of the Chautauqua. You've got the bank in Palatka interested in getting this thing solved because it's their money. Yeah. You got the army interested in getting this thing solved because it's their rifles. So you've got these different groups all wanting answers. Yeah. And, Parker finds himself right in the middle, in the crucible of action, as I call it in writing fiction. 
He's in the crucible of action among all these outside sources. He has to deal with a couple of arrogant Pinkertons that uh, have been hired by, uh, by the bank to come down and, and find the money. Uh, and then he's got this captain by the name of Abel Stratton, who's been assigned the job of finding the rifles. And Chipley has hired Parker to make sure they don't get in the way of him finding out what happened so he can have his Chautauqua. So you've got three different groups there all at work and sometimes not to the same ends. Yes. So interesting. And so you mentioned that in this case, it was the bank's money and the army's weapons. And then there were also murders as well, correct? Well, you got to have a murder. I mean, yeah. you can't have a good no. history without a murder. Trains and cowboys and yeah. You gotta have a murder. You know, my books, uh, my mystery, my riverboat mystery series had been classified by a couple of critics as Easterns. In other words, it takes place at the same time of all the Westerns you ever read, but it happens oh. in the East. And it's based That's on smart. the premise that, that everything interesting that happened in the 1870s and 80s wasn't just out West. We had a right. very rich world here in the East. And so my Eastern, so to speak, uh, is set during that time period. And uh, mm -hmm. in book three, in book three that comes out next year, uh, we'll talk about the Cracker Cowboy. And the Cracker Cowboy in Florida was just as much cowboy as the one in Wyoming, but he had different challenges. Instead okay. of the wide open spaces and herding the cattle, he spent most of his time in Florida trying to find them in the undergrowth. Ooh. That was called the Cracker Cowboy, but that'll show up in book three. Okay, interesting. So uh, that will come out next year, which is going to be 2025. The second book in the story should come out this March. Okay, it, March 2024. Yeah, and it's set along the St. Augustine and Palatka in the eastern part of the state. And Parker works for Henry Flagler, the second great railroad baron of Florida. Okay. Uh, also a real character? Absolutely. All right. So these murders, the robberies, all of this stuff, was this a common occurrence during the late 1800s with the railroads? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so much so that that's what Wells Fargo and the Pinkerton Agency spent a large part of their time doing, chasing down wow. railroad bandits. And uh -huh. Wells Fargo developed a special version of the Schofield pistol uh, with a shorter barrel on it so it could be carried concealed by Wells Fargo agents, often trying to protect the railroad from robbery. Oh, uh, funny timing. I was just reading about the Pinkertons last night on Wikipedia of all things. So interesting. So there's a character in your book named Captain Abel Stratton, who isn't a fan of Choctaw Parker. And Captain Stratton just seems like such a tool to me. What do you know about the real Captain Stratton? Well... Captain Stratton is a fictional character. Oh, okay. I got that but, wrong then. Okay. But he's based on actions, behaviors, and attitudes that are a blend of some real characters. In other oh. words, he becomes, he becomes an amalgamation, if you will, of some various characters through history. Uh, the arrogance, for example, the arrogance of Custer. Yeah. I don't need those Gatling guns. I got this under control. And then he goes up there and we know what happened with that, right? Yeah. Uh, so the arrogance of Custer, the the hatred shown towards some Native American people uh, by, by some of the army people out there that were operating against them. Uh, and we know of things that happened historically. You know, I won't relitigate all of history, but we know it's there. Uh, what I did find interesting and what I try to portray in the story, I think it comes out a little more in book two than in book one. It seems that in history, and some, some will disagree with this, but it seems in history, in the South, the, the Native American or the red man was assigned a nobility that the black man never had. Hmm. But when you got out West, the black man was assigned a nobility that the red man didn't have. Interesting. So I'll leave that for people to think about. Ponder yeah. whether you agree or disagree with that. Yeah. But people huh. treated people differently. 
on different mm-hmm. parts of the building. And Abel Stratton is this guy, you know, he just, he can't find anything good about Parker. Right. Parker's people, Parker's hair, he insults him all the time. You know, he yeah. is mission driven. Now he's positive. He believes in his mission and he don't want anything to take away from his mission. And as a soldier myself, I have to applaud being mission specific, you know, yeah. and that's good. But, you know, he, he climbs the ladder of success using people for the rungs. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that comes at a cost. So again, Choctaw Parker is a railroad detective and I'll read a portion of your book where he's doing his investigation. Argyle train stop is a few miles east of Defumiac Springs. And there still is a, 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 a little area called Argyle there. And that train track runs in the same path that it did then. And when I wrote this book, when I write, I go to the locations, I experience okay. it. So if I tell you that Parker walked from the Argyle train station two miles up the track at a certain time of day, it's because I've been there walking that track. I want to know what the sun feels like on my face, which direction it comes from, the sounds I can hear, what I can't hear. So I live out these stories as I write them. So this is him walking just as I did up that track, trying to figure out where the train robbery take, took place so he can find some kind of clue that will lead him to the culprits. So go right ahead. Love that. That brings this all to life even more. So next... Parker moved to the small clearing on the north side of the track where he found wagon ruts still visible in the dirt and evidence that someone had cleared a path in the undergrowth northward from the from the clearing. Parker glanced back at the rail line and then he walked the distance from where the tree had been dropped to where the baggage car would have been sitting. The sandy soil still showed evidence of where a wagon had been located beside the rail line. He used his finger to estimate the depths of the rut. It came up to the second knuckle on his little finger. Closing his eyes, he tried to picture the sights and the sounds of the day. The locomotive coming slowly to a stop in front of the felled pine. One, maybe even two wagons approach, maybe up to four men on horseback. Two of them board the train at the baggage car and two of them moved the ends of the passenger cars. Probably two to four others on the wagon receive the merchandise. Once inside the baggage car, they take the soldiers by surprise and attack them. They transfer the money and weapons, so would have taken three or four men to muscle those weapons, crates out of the rail car, and onto the waiting wagon. So smart guy, that Choctaw Parker, and I love how he came to that deductive reasoning to um, figure out what was going on during that robbery. Another topic that comes up in the book are the Dominickers. Tell us what the Dominickers are. The Dominickers were an actual group of of people, historical folks, that lived down in the Panhandle area of Florida, east of Defuniac Springs. They were half-breed folks. They were they were black mixed with Creek, mm. the Creek Nation. And uh, Parker, they're accused of the robbery. And so Parker dutifully has to investigate whether they've done it or not. In fact, a couple of them are in jail uh, near Defuniac Springs, and he goes down to interview them uh, with the help of the local sheriff. He wants to find out uh, if, if they are the actual culprits of this robbery. And Parker, Parker, you know, he doesn't want to believe they did it because he, yeah. can, he can sympathize with them, just empathize with them, because right. that's him. You know, mm-hmm. he's a mixed race individual. He, it could have been him sitting there. He doesn't want to believe they'll do it, but there's evidence and he's got to deal with that evidence. And so the Dominickers were a real group of people that lived in that area. Uh, Half Creek, half white, a half Creek, half black. I had never heard that term before. And I didn't realize that, you know, that that was a group of people down that way. The the term Dominickers comes from an actual term that's used to describe a chicken that has black and white feathering. Huh. Interesting. So see, listeners, we're learning so much about history and and probably parts of the country that we may not know about our Native American history. And chickens. Mm -hmm. And chickens, too. (laughs) So this storyline is going on while the Gulf Chautauqua was beginning in Florida. I know you talked a little bit about the event before. It kind of reminds me of um, 
the the World's Fair that would go on in different parts of the country, like Chicago and Louisville, where they'd bring in actually innovations like the first light bulb and things like that. But it sounds like this had to do with anything from science and history and philosophy and all that. But but why don't you tell us more about the Chautauqua itself? Well, there is a town called Chautauqua, New York. Uh, and it's in that area that they first began the Chautauquas, became very popular after the Civil War. Uh, Chautauquas began almost as a religious a group of people would go and do Bible studies and, and, and talk uh, in the area of religion. But then they began to include uh, other things like uh, gardening or cooking or uh, painting or music. And it began, the, the movement began to grow and these Chautauquas would be held in different towns and cities and it would have a huge draw of people, as I said, for a day or a week or a, a month if you could afford it. And uh, they would bring in lecturers and speakers. And as you said, uh, uh, it would be often on uh, uh, cutting edge technologies and things. One of the speakers in Blood on the Cross Ties is coming to discuss the building of a canal in Panama. So this is before the Panama Canal was ever built. This is this lecturer coming to give a talk wow. on the canal in Panama. And they, they would bring and they would show uh, images uh, from photos. They had a, an arc light capability. It looks kind of a like a, uh, a slide projector, but nothing so sophisticated like that. But they could put images in front of it and throw them up on a, on a sheet and you could see pictures of out west or pictures from Egypt or overseas. It, it was a great cultural event for people to participate in. And it had a great draw to it. I think of it as like a conference today. If you went to yeah. a, a conference. Yeah, absolutely. And and it was a way for people to be able to see things um, in person. And in some cases, touch the object instead yes. of just having to read the newspaper. On that same line in your book, Chipley shouted, Florida is on the verge of great expansion and settlement. I envision our state being a winter destination for people escaping the cold for decades to come. He pulled a brochure from a top desk drawer and held it up. I'm traveling to Defuniac Springs this week to open our Gulf Chautauqua. Says so right here, his fat finger tapped on the page. The first annual Florida Chautauqua. He passed the document to Parker and we've got visitors coming from all over the Eastern United States to participate in this month long event. I've got a beautiful new hotel built, guest speakers, teachers, preachers, and musicians from all over the country coming in. I put too much time, money, and effort into planning this, and I simply can't have a handful of criminals undermining people's confidence in coming here. They need to know they will be safe. So as you can see, listeners, this is a big event, and what's going on with the railroad robberies, as James said, can have a negative effect on the Chautauqua movement in Florida so that gives you a good jump start to the story within this book. It's action packed and filled with such fascinating history of the time. And of course, there's Choctaw Parker's own personal story and journey. For instance, he's in danger throughout much of the book, and it even gets a little creepy at times, but he feels the presence of his father with him along the way. Feel free to share with us from your book along those lines. Well, Parker's father, Parker's mother, is very important to him. She taught him his love of music. He still has that fiddle that belonged to her. Yeah. Uh, she's very, you learn, you learn why he doesn't like to ride horses. In fact, uh -huh. in mm -hmm. fact, Abel Stratton says, what kind of Indian doesn't like to ride horses? That's one of Abel Stratton's uh, digs yeah. at Parker. And he has reasons for that. There are reasons for that, uh, which I won't go into here. That's part of the story you have to read, but Yes. There are reasons that he, he prefers walking everywhere he goes or, or, or taking a, a train. Uh, but his mother was very important to him. His father, however, instilled in him the values and the value of life. Uh, we talk about in, in one section here, uh, we, he's a young boy and his father, he remembers being going deer hunting the first time with his father. And uh, his father teaching him the details and techniques of, of how to hunt him when to take the shot and uh, little little details like what's called deer drop and deer drop is when a deer hears a sound it will often 
bend its legs and drop three to six inches. And people that don't account for that, that take a shot today with modern weapons, will end up hitting the deer high and it won't be a kill shot. Same thing was true with a bow at the time. The thud of the, the bow itself could be heard by the deer. They have great hearing and they would drop slightly. That's a detail. And his father is teaching him this and, and, and how to recognize these details and how to hunt. And most importantly, how not to take a life that you don't have to take. Yes. Not to take a life, uh, to respect life. And he talks about that. He says, uh, he talks about aiming at him and taking the shot and everything. But he says, you know, if we're going to kill something, then we're going to use everything that animal has to offer us. We're never going to kill for the sake of killing. And this is something that per this advice from his father permeates Parker's life. And you will see this play out through this book and the future books of how he feels about taking a life and killing. Uh, it, there's a parallel that, to that today. Uh, in self-defense and teaching martial arts and self-defense, people will ask, well, now I don't understand. I don't understand the dichotomy or, or uh, it seems to me uh, paradoxical that, that you would spend time teaching us how to fight and how to hurt other people uh, and then spend so much time talking about being a peace loving person and wanting peace. Well, as one person said one time, better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Mm, well said. So Parker is a warrior in a garden until he has to become something else. In other words, he, he, he doesn't want to involve in this violence. He doesn't want to kill, but you know, he will do it under circumstances where it would be justifiable not yes. take a life just to take a life. And that's something his father made very important to him. So he's in a hotel room and he's chasing a bad guy or who he thinks is a bad guy. And I think he thinks they're on to him and know what he's in town for. And he's up in his hotel room. I think this is the part you're going to read about. He's up in his hotel room and and uh, he's uh, he's trying to sleep, but stay awake enough just in case of difficulty. So yeah, Parker had a dream that caused him to sit straight up in the bed. His father's face and voice were still vivid in his mind. Your blood will rush and your hands shake when you see the animal, his father Nita Ehamko said, pointing to his nose. You must breathe in as you quietly draw the bow. He pointed to his mouth, then out slowly. Stop breathing as you release the cord. Now the deer will hear the plunk of your bowstring and he will lift his head into the air and his body will drop. He held up three fingers. So you must aim this much below the heart or your arrow will miss or only wound him. That was to me was just so fascinating that piece about talking him through that. I could almost see his father Nita saying that to him. I also like how Choctaw Parker's father guided him and taught him about, as you said, killing just to kill is not their way and how to respect the animals they killed for food and so on. He was a good man. And his father's influence also helped him to respond to the racism he was experiencing, as well as the trials he had gone through in his life, which listeners you'll learn more about throughout the book, as we said now, there are a couple of scary characters who were real life people in your book. I don't want to give away too much from the plot, but let's talk about high level about a couple of those people. Tell us about Hogtie Terrell and why he was called Hogtie. Well, Hogtie Terrell, I refer to it as Terrell, but it could be Terrell. Okay. He's an enforcer who works for one of the main culprits. I don't want to give too much away here. One of the main culprits in the story. Uh, mm. He kind of leads a band of criminals and thugs who are intimidating landowners, intimidating some of these freedmen who've been given land. Remember, I talked about that earlier. They've been given land and they think life is going to be better now. Now they've got some of their own people coming around, intimidating them and acting like thugs to steal their land and give them to large landowners for the uh, for the trees and, and the timber and the turpentine that they can mine from. Them. So Hogtie got his nickname because that's what he does to people. Oh. Uh, 
when they don't comply, he hog ties them, which is to tie your hands behind your back and then your feet back behind your, your back and then your feet to your hands. And he just got a reputation for hog tying people uh, who didn't comply with the demands that were being made on them uh, to separate them from their property. It was a rough crowd. It was the wild east. It was the wild, wild west. Oh, I, love it. I love that you said that. Well, and whatever happened to him, this hog tie guy? Well, in the story, uh, it says that uh, he gets his comeuppance. I, 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 bet, I really don't want to say that right now because that might give away too much. Oh, okay. People to be able to fully experience uh, uh, his comeuppance, if you will. Oh, yeah. Then there was Cyrus and Laura Riley, who I found to be so sneaky and sinister. Just give us a taste of what they were up to in the book. You know, some people, people aren't always all good or all bad. Uh, people will do the wrong thing for the right reasons. Uh, they may have purity in their, in their motive, but be depraved in their action. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly uh, Cyrus uh, is one of those people who he wants to see uh, the freedmen treated well, but he also wants to prosper in his business and he wants a little power and he wants a little influence and he wants a little control. And he has, if he has to grind the little people under the ground to get it, well, then that's what he would do. Uh, in, in book three, there's a character who claims he's a, quote, man of the people. Mm -hmm. uh, but he behaves like uh, one of the wealthy aristocrats while confessing to be a man of the people. And I think Cyrus has a little bit of that in him in book one, too. Uh, he, he has the right ideas, but how he executes them just grinds others underfoot. So you have two more books coming out, and it sounds like they'll include Matilda Vance, Chubb Moody, and Jimmy Lee Parker, right? Well, yes. I mean, what's going to happen here is right? uh, the three separate at the end of book one. You know, you know they go their separate yep. ways. But, you know, Parker gets hired by the second great railroad baron of Florida about a year, year and a half later, Henry Flagler. Henry Flagler is building the Ponce de Leon Hotel in St. Augustine, Florida. At the time, the, the the crown jewel of hotels in the United States. Ooh. And he's, he's in the process of building this now. And he's had to buy out an entire railroad just to get all the supplies down there. And he's running into some, some challenges from the local people. Uh, a lot of people want the railroad to come in there and do that. There are people who are threatened by that because not everybody's happy about it. So he's had to hire Choctaw Parker uh, uh, for security purposes in the building of his, his building and his railroad. Well, Choctaw quickly realizes when he takes this job that it's more than he can handle. So who does he reach out to? Well, he reaches out to Chubb Moody. Who Absolutely. reaches out to Matilda Vance, uh -huh. who's off running her Pharaoh games. But in book two, another character comes in and that's Matilda Vance's son, Ed. Oh, Edgar. okay. And Edgar has been an apprentice to a doctor in Southern Illinois, but uh, he's uh, trying to figure out where his mother goes. He doesn't really know what his mother does for a living. She's told him that, he, oh. that she, she's a fabric buyer and uh, he, he, he finds out the hard way that she's not. And there's a lot of tension between Matilda and her son when he comes to find her. And he gets involved uh -oh. in the investigation. So that's that's where that one goes. Oh. That comes out, like I said, in March. That's the plan right now in March. And the third book is set in Tampa uh, and Arcadia in central, southern central Florida, where Parker is hired by the third great railroad baron of Florida, who is Henry Plant, for whom Plant City was named. Mm -hmm. And the plant system was a major Eastern railroad system that serviced all kinds of folks. And plant is busy trying to cover his tracks in Tampa to keep people from figuring out that he needs to buy the land that leads from Tampa out West to Brushy Point so he can have a deep water port for his steamship industry. 
So he's yeah. trying to conceal that, and people are trying to find out about it. And there's yeah. murder. Blood at the Whistle Stop is the name of the third book. So I'll give you the names. The second book in St. Augustine, Palatka is called Blood on the Trestles, Murder in Florida's Ancient City. And book three, when he works for Plant, is called Blood at the Whistle Stop, Murder on Florida's Peace River. And those are the Whoa. three in the series. Just the names alone are intriguing. And tell us one more time where folks can find your books. Amazon.com, Barnes and Noble, and uh, of course, Touchpoint Press. Uh, they have their own website and you can acquire the book there. And the audio book will be available at the end of this month from audiobooks.com. Fantastic. And so y'all go get these books. You're going to see so much more within the books that you know, we definitely held back quite a bit. And thank you for your service to our country. We really appreciate that. And before we go, are there any words of wisdom you would like to share with our listeners? Well, yeah, I, I want you to read, first of all, not, not just my works, not just my books, but read in general, study history, learn from it. Uh, don't be afraid of the truth. And I hit on that a little bit earlier. We don't, we don't have to hide from history. We don't have to go out and destroy the statues. We need to learn what they teach us. Mm. And that's the beauty of history is learning from it. Uh, and so we don't make the same mistakes again. Uh, yeah. And the famous quote is, you know, those that fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I want to say something to you. I appreciate the fact that you dug deeply into this story. Sometimes I do podcasts and interviews and people kind of skim the book and ask me a general question. But, you know, uh, you got down to the nitty gritty. You really Aww. paid attention <laughs> to the story. And I, apl I applaud that. that. That's wonderful. That's what people <laughs> need to hear. Good work. You get well, thank you. That means a lot. A of course, yes, yes. I'll take it. I'll take it. It's been a long time since I've been graded. It's been a long time since I had an A. But... I, I do appreciate that. Yako Key Major Brewer for visiting with me today. And we look forward to your next books hitting the shelves. Y'all go check them out. Thanks again. Thanks for listening to Native Chalk Talk. Be sure to join our community on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And check us out at nativechalktalk.com. Stay tuned for the next episode. You're going to love it. Yako Key. Thank you, my friends. <laughs>